On this episode of Conversations with Rich Bennett. My mother had an older sister older sister, whom she was very close to. And one of the things I talk about in this book is while both of my parents um, ended up being liberated by the U.S. Army and ended up as refugees and Mm -hmm. in the United States, my mother had an older sister. My father had a younger brother. The younger brother ended up in labor camps as well, but he ended up while trying to escape being captured by the Red Army forced back to Ukraine, which then became Soviet Union. And my mother's older sister had a child, couldn't leave when my mother left. And so she was also stuck back behind the Iron Curtain. And so both my parents had 50 years of not seeing um, or conversing with their siblings Coming to you from the Freedom Federal Credit Union Studios, Harford County Living presents Conversations with Rich Bennett. Come on, you're faster than me. We've been together. Oh man, you already said it. I was going to ask her if she remembered the date. Thanks for joining the conversation. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce a very special guest, Oksana Kukurotsa. Oksana is not only the managing director of Accenture in New York, but also a beacon of inspiration, being the daughter of Ukrainian refugees. Her journey from her family's humble beginnings to becoming a leader in the corporate world is nothing short of extraordinary. Oksana is also a distinguished author her contributions to the anthologies Going Against the Grain and Think Limitlessly have been widely acclaimed. Currently, she is working on her narrative nonfiction, Sunflowers Bend But Rarely Break. I love that title. A touching exploration of her family's experiences during the tough times of World War II and the Cold War. This book promises to offer an insightful look into the Ukrainian history and identity, a topic close to her heart. When she's not leading in the business world or penning down compelling stories, Oksana enjoys exploring the vibrant streets of Manhattan, always on the lookout for new culinary adventures and playgrounds for her young daughter. Oh, God, why do I have a funny feeling we're going to be talking about food on this episode again? (laughs) So, everybody, please join me in welcoming Oksana, a true embodiment of resilience, heritage, and leadership. How are you doing, Oksana? Right up the road, too, in New York. I am. Yep, I live right in, Man- right in Manhattan, so almost almost downtown. Sort of between now, downtown, midtown. <laughs> now, how long have you been up there? Uh, I'm saying up there. I'm in Maryland. Well, it is up there. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's a little bit up there. <laughs> so I've been in Manhattan now since 2007. So okay. for quite a while. Um, but I am a native New Yorker from the state of New York. I was born and raised in Rochester, New York. And then I moved around quite a bit. My last stop before New York City was down south in Atlanta, Georgia. Wow, that's a yeah. big switch. Yeah, a uh, grad school brought me there, and then I started, okay. uh, and then I started working with Accenture down there. And just to be completely open and transparent, as of December first, I've left Accenture. So I just want to make sure your listeners what? hear that in case someone from Accenture hears it. Yeah, yeah. So the company How and I have. You with- I was there for almost twenty-two years. So the company and I have parted ways, and I am looking for new adventures. So. Um, well, definitely you're, you're the doing... work project, you know, the book project, and then I'm sure there are, there are many other things that I'll be doing in the future. I was going to say your new adventure is the book, which is going to become a movie. I hope so. I have my fingers. Oh, crossed. it will. <laughs> it it will definitely without a doubt. Wow! So after 22 years, you left there. Yeah. Wow! Holy cow! Well, yeah. I mean, it, and it seems like you're seeing that more and more. Unfortunately, it, it yes. Um, there's um there's a lot of a lot of that going on in terms yeah. of um you know it's it's very rare now I would say for someone to retire from a company that they've 
that they've worked at for quite a long time. And yeah. you know, that has just been the, the trend for one reason or another, right? Since, gosh, yep. probably back in the 1980s. <laughs> yeah, unless, unless you work for the government, you know. <laughs> Very and, and, good point, yes. Yeah, and, and even, well, so, I mean, sometimes depending on which part of the government, sometimes they're they're asking people to retire early. That is true. Yeah, that is true yeah, as well. So. They don't want to pay that full pension. That's, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> so remember that you remind me to up, update my biography. So this way I kind of scrap that one out. <laughs> okay. So with, before we get into the book and everything, mm-hmm. tell everybody who is Oksana, because you were, correct me if I'm wrong, but you weren't born in Ukraine, right? Correct. I was not okay. born in Ukraine. So okay. I am the daughter of two Ukrainian immigrants uh, who happened to settle down in Rochester, New York, and raise 12 children, of which I am number 12. And so my parents had me very late in life. I know, I, I see your face. 12, <laughs> 12 children. children. Yes. I mean, you could wow. write a whole book about that on its own, but that isn't the primary purpose of the, the book that I'm writing, though I do talk right. a little bit about what it's like having so many siblings. Um, anyway, uh, you know, I, you know, I had a, a pretty average kind of life in terms of uh, growing up the daughter of immigrants being born in the U S and, you know, having, you know, Ukrainian language and culture at home, but then stepping out right. into the bright wide world of the United States and, and having an American culture. And so I always felt like I had, you know, two feet in both worlds and never really belonged in either of them. I had a, you know, hefty load of cynicism and skepticism as most Europeans do, as well as that, you know, bunch of optimism that we Americans Uh have that I adore so much. Uh, And so one of the things that had always been in my family that we had talked about, though my parents didn't really give us a lot of information about, was how they made it to the United States. And they they, uh, grew up um, in a part of Ukraine that's called Western Ukraine today. That was mm-hmm. part of Poland in between the two great wars of World War One, World War Two, and during World War Two, um, it was invaded by uh, Nazi Germany, and uh, both of my parents, um, my mother through propaganda and a good sales pitch, and my father through forced kidnapping and deportation, ended up in Germany, uh, wow. in. Um, as as slave laborers, basically. And so I found out recently that my mother slaved uh, for a Volkswagen in Germany, and my father worked on a on a farm estate in a, in a town called Artern in in Germany, or Arten, sorry, in in Germany. Right. And wow. And it was interesting because they both had different experiences. I know a little bit more about my mother's experience because I interviewed Mm -hmm. her once in, in high school about it and um and she she lived very much in slave encampments not um that much better than a concentration camp with uh with uh, ss soldiers and uh you know machine guns and and dogs mm-hmm. and things um to to keep everybody in line and so it was a story that we all grew up with and quite a bit of um of, I would say, Eastern European uh, diaspora that came to the United States uh, have a similar story. And after the war, those who were liberated by Americans and found, you know, nice American soldiers allowed them to become refugees um, and state refugee status to be able to stay in Germany and displace prison camps. And then eventually through the, um, it was the United States Refugee Relief Act, right. they were able to uh, make it and immigrate to the United States and uh, create a home for all their children. So now all of their children are U.S. citizens. Half were born in Germany. The other half of us were born here in the United States. And, you know, my parents' legacy is with this flourishing family. And so for me, I did, you know, different things. You know, I went off and became an accountant and a CPA right. and then a management consultant. But I always had this burning desire to write and I always loved writing. And with the onset of the war in Ukraine and just seeing my 
parents' story, um, both mm -hmm. on TV and in the newspapers almost every day. You know, when I think of, you know, the, the bombings, um, when I think of the internment camps, you know, we hear about these internment camps that the Russians are keeping about how um, Russians are stealing Ukrainian children. I mean, the Nazis stole children, yeah, too, yeah. that looked Aryan. And um, it was just like, you know, watching or reading my parents' story on TV, TV every day or in the news every day. And I felt like there's this huge component of history that we're forgetting um, because yeah. it's been so long uh, since the 1940s. And I mean, people are even denying the Holocaust, you know, which is insanity. And so I, I just wanted to shine a light on a little known piece of history that isn't unique necessarily to Ukraine. So many people probably wouldn't know this. I, I was surprised and shocked when I started reading about um, the, the Nazi uh, slave legacy was that right. they brought 12 to 13 million people from West Germany and sorry, Western Europe and Eastern Europe to Germany, either through propaganda, through forced deportation, kidnapping to work. And the way that, and it was forced labor because they weren't allowed to go home. Like they, they had to yeah. pay, um, but the levels of salary and treatment really differed depending on your ethnicity. And so if anyone's aware of, of Hitler's um, master race theory, where Aryans were at the, and Germans were at the top, and then anyone with kind of similar Aryan heritage, either uh, Scandinavian or, or British, you know, they were kind of treated the next best, and then Western Europeans were treated the next best, and then at the very bottom were the the Jews and the Roma um, who were in handicapped, who were considered right. you know, parasites and. Um, not human and really set aside for extermination. Well, many people don't know is Eastern Europeans and Slavs, especially the Slavic people were just considered one rung up from the uh, Jews in Roma. And we were actually called subhuman and there's a German word for it. Um, and the purpose for subhumans were to be slaves. And so in the slave camps, Jeez. Slavs in particular had very brutal experiences. I mean, not as bad as concentration camp. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I want to be careful about um, how I describe their experiences. But they were, their salaries were about 20% of a Western European salary or German salary. And then many of that was either taxed away or taken by the companies that they worked for to pay for their used clothing <laughs> that they were offered to buy mm. um, food that, you know, constituted, you know, meager bread and watery cabbage soup um, and accommodations, which oftentimes um, included, you know, like a straw bench or something to sleep on. And so, you know, some of the, the research and reading that I've done, um, you know, state that they were lucky if they had pocket money. And then oftentimes they couldn't even use that pocket money because they weren't allowed to to shop in German stores. And I remember, uh, you know, asking mm. my, my mom to kind of tell me a, a bit about her story. And when we talked about payment, um, you know, and I asked her, well, did you get paid for your work? And she said, well, you know, she kind of laughed it off and said, well, you know, there really wasn't anything to buy. I mean, she didn't focus on wow. how she was treated. So I don't know a lot of information about the discrimination that she personally had to endure. But I do know quite a bit from the research um, right. that, that those people were not treated well. Uh, the other thing that many of us know about if we've studied the Holocaust or even watched some of the Holocaust films is how the Jews had to wear the Star of David patch, mm -hmm. you know, to, to signify them at all times. Well, Eastern Europeans had to do the same. So if you were Polish, you had to wear a patch with a P on it. If you were from the former Soviet Union, 
um, or in, in Eastern European, they had a, a specific term for that in German called Ostobeiter, which is which means Eastern worker. And um, for that, you had to wear an OST on your patch. And so even um, within the Slava culture, the Germans had different hierarchies. So Poles were actually treated a little bit better than even Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Russians that would have to wear that OST patch. Wow. You did a lot of research. Um, and I'm still <laughs> doing a lot of research. In fact, Rich, I'm headed off to Germany as, uh, as soon as uh, after Christmas to what? do some more physical research. So to actually retrace um, my parents' steps through their camp experiences, like revisit those places, as well as the, the at least the areas of the displaced right. camps that they stayed in after the war. Uh, so when you interviewed your mother, how was it hard for her to open up about that, about everything? Or was she comfortable talking about it? So um, kind of fortunately and unfortunately, when I interviewed her, I was 17 years old and I was writing a college essay paper. And that's okay. what um, kind of prompted me to ask her if she would be willing to talk about her experiences. I, I've always been a good student of history and and really loved history. I'm not a historian by trade or anything. And I've always found that subject of World War II very fascinating because yeah. of my parents' experiences in it. And so when I asked her, I was surprised that she agreed to be interviewed because she was very close-lipped about it. My father was absolutely close-lipped, <laughs> talked very little about that experience because I think, you know, there were probably terrible um, memories yeah. that they had. And they also probably felt some shame at, mm -hmm. you know, being there, not fighting back, maybe, um, you know, either being duped into going um, as well as um, just their treatment, right? I mean, yeah. that has to have, I mean, I know that that had a long living effect on them. You know, basically every day of your life being told that you're less than, right? Yeah. And something that could easily be passed on multi-generational and, and trust me has been. So there are things that I've been dealing with all my life. And so my mother was, I would say, as open as she felt comfortable being with mm -hmm. me. And I would say as a 17-year-old who's still pretty self-absorbed and maybe didn't have all the right questions to ask, you know, there was a lot that I may have been able to uncover, but, but maybe not, because when I right. did touch upon some tough subjects like, well, did you, you know, you know, did you see Jews? You know, mm -hmm. did, how did you feel about how they were treated? Did you try to help them? You know, when I asked her those kinds of questions, you could tell there was just, you know, pain in her face and she sort of avoided yeah. it because, you know, her response to that you know, was there, there wasn't anything I could do. What could God. someone do? And you were the, you were the youngest of 12? Yes, the youngest. So, okay. So how, actually, how old were your parents when they moved here to the States? So my parents moved to the U.S. in 1956, so they would okay. have been in their late, I think their late 30s or early 40s. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah late late 30s, almost early 40s, yeah. Okay, and if you don't mind me asking, when, when they came here to, well, I take it, with 12 kids, your mom was probably a stay-at-home mom. She, yes, <laughs> yes, that would, okay. be a, <laughs> that would be a very good assumption. It, it was only... Um, yeah, it was only when the, the last couple of us were born that she went back and did did some work because she Okay. I mean she she also had a lot of help. So she right. um you know, my, my oldest sisters, you know, did a lot. In fact, my oldest sister, you know, practically raised me because at that point in time my my mother was tired and working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what was it that your father was doing when he moved here? Um, as far as work. Goes. Yeah. So he did a lot of odd jobs to begin with mm -hmm. when he first arrived, but his first uh, full-time job was with a company called Tobin's, which was a um, meat, com meat packing company and okay. but butcher meat packing company in uh, Rochester, New York. And so he learned um, the butchery trade. 
Oh, nice. And he did that for about 20, 25, 20, 25 years. Then he was laid off and the meatpacking company closed and he wow. ended up finding, he was very lucky. He ended up finding uh, work with Eastman Kodak company for his last 10 years uh, as a uh, janitor, and he was able to retire from Eastman Kodak Company. And then that's a big switch. Yeah. And then the irony of all of this, too, Rich, is in my research, I have learned that a subsidiary of Eastman Kodak Company also used slave and concentration camp labor in Germany and oh, headquarters in Rochester knew about it. So everything just sort of comes full circle. So I could, you know, look at that company and say, shame on you, you need a tone. Right. But then on the other hand, you know, you did allow my father to uh, to finish out work and retire and earn and earn a pension. It's you know, it's it's a complex world that we live in. You know, and it's it's very very much shades of gray. That's one thing I've always wanted to do was be a butcher. Really? <laughs> yeah, I I just it, it and it's still to this day it still amazes me how how a butcher knows the the right cuts to make. Right, the level you know, of precision. It, it, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, to me, it's an art. I'm lucky if I can even scale a fish, you know? I mean, <laughs> or even cut my steak while, without messing something. There you go. And I agree with you. I mean, one of the, I mean, my, my father always brought home, you know, really good meat and he always knew what to do mm -hmm. with meat. But one of the things he became famous for later in life and in retirement was he made like the best kielbasa, which we, we would call kielbasa. What? Yeah, so Polish sausage or homemade, Ukraine, homemade. When he had a smoker out in his backyard, and he would make it down in the basement, and everything oh. was super homemade, super fresh. He would put a ton of spices and garlic in it, and and you know he used really good quality meat, very little, you know, very little like bone and fat, and so it was just mm -hmm. super high quality, fresh. Really amazing with all of that garlic taste. I mean, I had friends who would, mm. um, when they heard that I was, you know, getting a, either a shipment in or going home for some sausage, they would say, okay, make sure you get some extra links and you save me one. And this was when I was in college. <laughs> That's something I, my, my son's mother, her, was it her aunt? Mm -hmm. Every Thanksgiving, we'd always go to her aunt and uncles uh, for Thanksgiving and her mother or her aunt made who made kielbasa? Mm -hmm. I know it's it's I, amazing. Isn't oh, it? <laughs> it is, and I'm. It cannot. It, it, you the store bought stuff now. I know. I know. Just not the same. Just not the same. Mm -hmm. That's something I miss big time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the only thing you can get close is if you can find you know a Polish butcher or a Ukrainian mm -hmm. butcher, and then you can go to the store. I mean, I'm. Very fortunate to live in Manhattan, uh, near the Ukrainian Polish community, so I, I can still get it. But, uh, but it's still, you know, it's it's probably you know eighty percent or eighty five percent yeah. as good as my dad's, but not not quite as good as my father's. So, so as the youngest daughter, yes, well, the, the youngest child, right? I mean, the youngest, youngest of, the of everything, yeah. <laughs> How was it growing up? I mean, were you picked on a lot or were you the angel? <laughs> you were the angel. <laughs> so I was really small and they all said I was very cute. And so all of my siblings were very, very um, protective of me. And so, okay. in fact, um, I... I always tell people that I I grew up with six mothers because there's six and six of us. So six girls, six boys. And I grew up with my mom, but I grew up with five other mothers um, mm -hmm. who, you know, made sure that that um, that I was well taken care of. And even all of my brothers were very pr protective of me as well. And in fact, um, I'll, I'll give you a good example of it if you want to tell me, uh, tell you kind of a funny story. Oh, yeah. Is uh, when... Um, this is uh, in the winter time, you know, when you when it was too cold or snowy to go outside. We would all play hide and seek down in my parents' basement, and we lived in a, a small brick house from like the 1910s, so super old. And oh, wow. uh, there were lots of my parents kept a lot of stuff in the basement, so there was lots of hiding spots all over the place. And because I was super little at the time, I mean, I was 
I had memories of it. So, you know, I must've been four years old, but I wasn't going to school yet. And someone would have to hide with me. Like that was, um, you know, because I was too young to hide on my own. And so okay. someone always had to hide with me. And it was always a rotation because there was always a downside of hiding with Oksana. And the downside was as soon as the seeker was done counting and everyone was hiding, that's all the seeker had to do was call out, Oksana, where are you? And I would immediately, regardless of who was with me, going, shh, 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 shh. <laughs> over here. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever hid with me became the seeker and lost. And so I would be rotated off to the next, you know, we'll just call them sucker. <laughs> you were not good at hide and seek at all. Were you? Not at that age. No. <laughs> oh, that is too funny. And what's the age difference from, from you to the oldest? Yeah, 25 years. So my oldest what? is 25 years old. Yeah, he was born in Germany. Wow. 47, yeah. <laughs> in fact, he had a daughter who was almost two years older than me. So the moment I popped out, I was an aunt. An aunt. <laughs> wow. Yep. That had... that. that well, I guess when you're that young, you don't understand it. But as you started getting older, and here it is, you know, other person's probably playing with you, calling mm -hmm. you aunt. Mm, she didn't that call me aunt. Weird. She didn't call me aunt. But we, oh, I mean, we, okay. knew, we knew our relationship from a very right. young age. But, yeah, we okay. were, you know, we, we acted more like sisters than uh, sisters or cousins, I would say. It, it wasn't. I mean, I, I don't think she ever really called me aunt, but, but it wasn't until <laughs> <clears throat> she had her own, her own child and she didn't, I mean, she, she had her first child at 27. So it wasn't as if she was, she was all that young, but it wasn't until I became a great aunt at 25 that I really realized the down age, you know, the downside of having, uh, having a, a niece who's wow. older than you. Yeah. That, that, that made me feel like a really old 25 year old. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So when, when, when it came to family, uh, especially ho holidays, well, mm -hmm. just anything, just family functions. Mm -hmm. What was it that, what was something that you all liked to do? Well, you know, you did well, hide and seek there. No, that's out because you were not good at that. <laughs> but what was something that you always looked forward to doing with the family? Well, I think for holidays, um, you know, especially as the older siblings grew up and mm -hmm. moved out of the house. So I think what was fun for holidays was just bringing everyone together. And I mean, we always yeah. had kind of a loud and boisterous house because how can you not? You had to. You, right. Uh, but it even became louder. And so when <laughs> um, when we got together, you know, and, and we still do this, Rich, so my parents have Right away, you know, ages ago, um, you know, my, my dad now over 20 years ago, and, and I think we're coming up on my mother's um, uh, anniversary death, you know, in, in uh, right. 20 years next year. So or, or in, it would be 2025. So in, uh, yeah, in about a year. And oh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, we still all get together because for us, um, you know, we, we always have a lot of fun when we get together. So we're a big family. We're all pretty opinionated. And some of us have, you know, divergent, you know, very divergent political views and things, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, people say you should never talk about politics on the holidays. And we always do. And we, you know, we get into arguments, but then we'll laugh and we'll drink and we'll, you know, have fun and no one ever leaves angry. And so I would say, you know, the thing that we always looked forward to other than getting together and having, you know, Ukrainian food, which we don't always get all of the time, you know, but, you know, having the, the folks that would make all the, the really good stuff is, um, you know, just being able to get together and laugh and drink. And we even as a, as a family, I mean, not all of us, because it would be too many, but, you know, there's a core group of about 10 to 12 of us that will go on vacation every year together. 
we stopped. Oh, wow. Yeah, we stopped um, during COVID because obviously no one right. was traveling. But we started it up again this year and we went down to Hilton Head. A group of 10 of them. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I'm glad you mentioned that about, you know, when you all get together, even talking politics. Yeah, you, some of you argue, but you don't leave mad. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something missing from families nowadays yeah. because people don't know how to converse I you know, they're, or they're that. afraid to. And it's uh-huh. like you you need to because – and this is something I've always tried to explain to the kids. They're like, well, you, we don't want you telling us what, what we should do. And, sh-. and I said, no, it's called opinions. Mm-hmm. Everybody has an opinion, mm-hmm. but that's how you learn. You talk about mm-hmm. it, and that's how you learn more about it. And I think that's something that's missing for some reason. People, especially when it comes to politics and religion, people are afraid to talk about it because they feel like it's a debate. And there's a difference between a debate and a conversation. No, I agree with and, you. I think the other thing is they're afraid to offend or to be offended. Yeah. And I think yeah. you need to, I think the other thing too is I think, people believe they're further apart than they really are because Mm -hmm. you do things by text message. It's so, you know, far removed, right? So if you converse writing, things are so far removed. So it's easy to take a, an extreme position and you don't have to have a conversation, right? But when you actually sit down with someone whom you believe, and I do this with my family all the time, you know, when we text message each other, we have very divergent views. Mm -hmm. But when we sit down and we have a conversation and we, and you can't have a conversation without listening. (laughs) So you have to listen, you have to be open-minded and Mm -hmm. then you share. And when you share your position with each other, and you're able to spend the time to talk about, you know, the complexities and the deepness of why you formulated your opinion, right? Or your point mm-hmm. of view. Then you actually can find things that you might agree about right. you know, or even come closer together about. Like, oh, I hadn't thought about your position that way. And I don't you know, not disagree with what you're saying, but here's, you know, my perspective of it. Right. And, you know, whether it's, you know, gun control or immigration or or those kinds of things, you'd be surprised if you actually sit next to someone that both of you are a little more practical than maybe you would originally think you are. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, whether you're Democrat, whether you're Republican, whether you're independent, I guarantee you, if if you take two people of the same party and sit them down and talk and give them subjects, at one point, there's going to be something they disagree with. Uh, of course. You know, and, and uh, anyways. Yeah, and if you uh, take two <laughs> different parties, there you're going to find things that they'll agree upon. Exactly. Realities. Exactly. Exactly. Well, look how many people that go into politics end up changing their, their um political affiliation yeah, party oh, affi- absolutely. yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, happens all the time. okay <laughs> yep so so your book the book that you're working on mm-hmm. sunflowers bend but rarely break first of all i gotta ask how you came up with that title because i love it oh thank you some people have been telling me it's too long and i might have to shorten it but we'll see no no <laughs> no no leave it the way it is leave it the way it is so um so first of all sunflowers are the national flower of ukraine Mm -hmm. Uh, Secondly, sunflowers are also the largest agricultural export of Ukraine. And um, many people are now realizing that Ukraine is the center of very rich black black soil and has been called in the past the breadbasket of Europe uh, because of the, Mm -hmm. um, the rich soil and the agriculture that it produces. And sunflower oil is the largest export for Ukraine. And we all know how important, um, ex, you know, exporting any kind of food yeah. product is for Ukraine to continue to survive, um, to obtain foreign currency, but also for, uh, the rest of the world, you know, in terms of, um, being able to, to feed, feed the world. And so sunflowers are, are key. Uh, another reason why sunflowers are, are very key. The, the other thing, thing that's interesting about sunflowers is 
just the way that they are um, yeah. very much addicted to the sun, you know, and they, they live off of the sun, I think more than, than even other flowers to the point mm-hmm. where, you know, they will bend and contort themselves, you know, as, as much as they can to get at that little bit of sunlight. And so I think of it as, you know, a sunflower bending as far as it can, even in the darkest days to just try to find some light. And so when I think about my parents' experience and how resilient they were to survive their experience during World War II and then come to the U.S. and build a thriving family. Or if I even think about Ukraine and Ukrainians today and what they're going through. I mean, they're showing their resilience every day to us and showing us how much they're sunflowers, just like my parents were. Let's take a little break here. I want to tell you about Maryland Pro Wash. Their passion is in making your items look like new. Their expertise is in pressure washing from driveways, houses, decks, fences, and awnings to apartment complexes, townhomes, strip malls, and storefronts. They want to clean it up for you from top to bottom. Contact them today to get a free quote. Either go to MarylandProWash.com. Again, MarylandProWash.com. Or call them at 443-752-1754. Again, that's 443-752-1754. Maryland Pro Wash, from top to bottom, they're going to clean your home. See, and that's why you can't change the title. Because it's got more that's than one meaning. That's how I feel, too. Yeah, and especially with everything that's going on today, what your parents went through, mm-hmm. you know, they're... They will are and everybody now they are the sunflowers and you can bend them, but they're not going to break no matter what. So yeah, if anybody tells you to change the title, tell them to take a hike. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll remember that. I'll say Rich Bennett you said can, I cannot change you the title. Can't. <laughs> you can't change the title. It's perfect, and that's what I love about it. When whether it's a book, whether it's a song, or whatever, sometimes that title can have meet different meanings, mm-hmm. and yours does, which makes it so much better. So, uh, and what, why did you decide to start writing the book? I decided to write the book after the invasion, the latest. Oh, so you start? Okay. Now I didn't. I decided to write it. I didn't start writing it until okay. uh, January of um, uh, twenty twenty three, and the. So what happened was uh, I started writing um, chapters for a couple Mm -hmm. of uh, leadership books for a friend of mine that have been published. And you mentioned them going against the grain and and think limitlessly. And when we were promoting the first one going against the grain, it was right when the invasion happened. Uh, And a couple of weeks after that, I was meant to be, uh, to give an interview to an Australian online news organization. Mm -hmm. And I was really struggling with it because I, you know, I was just, I was so sad and devastated because not only am I Ukrainian American, but um, we haven't talked about it, but back in 1996, 97, I spent 18 months working and living in Ukraine. So, and I lived in in Kiev uh, and worked oh. in different cities across Ukraine, including Dnipro and Krivory, Rih and Lviv. And so, and then I've traveled around Ukraine as well as a tourist to Odessa. I've right. even been to Crimea, to, to Yalta. And so it became very personal to me what was happening. And I was devastated by it. And my friend said, talk about Ukraine. Don't talk about the book. You know, and a little bit of my chapter in the book was my experience in Ukraine anyway. So it was all interrelated. And right. coming out of that interview, you know, I, I told my friend, this is what I have to do. You know, I, I need to write a book about my parents and what happened to them so I can shine a light on this little known time during World War II and how related it is to what's being done today. Because to right. me, Vladimir Putin is the same Nazi fascist as Adolf Hitler was. Or mm-hmm. you know, to me, Stalin was more of a, a 
of a, of a Nazi than, than he was a communist. I mean, he was, right. you know, he was incredibly brutal and, you know, people can argue who was worse, Hitler and Stalin, but I think it's all the same thing. You know, my, my parents would argue it in the basement all the time and neither of them ever won the argument, you know? Um, <laughs> I didn't start writing it right away just because I had a very young child at, at that point in time. So she was, only, okay. she was only one years old. So I just didn't have the capacity to, to be able to start writing it right away. And so I finally uh, started writing it in early January of this year. Um, I was able to complete a first draft by the summertime, but then I started finding out some new information about my parents because I discovered that there is a little known uh, our archive organ archived organization or organization that's uh, that uh, prides itself in Germany um, on collecting archived information about oh. um, what happened uh, during the Nazi period as well as the displaced person period of, of people right. living in in refugee camps after World War II and so through that organization I was able to retrieve documents from both my parents none of them during the war everything was after the war but where they had to fill out information for INRA which was the yeah. nation's organization that oversaw the refugee crisis um, in in Germany and, and other uh, former occupied areas of of Nazi Germany post World War II and so you know one had to fill out documentation. You know, if you wanted to live in the DP camps, if you wanted to be a refugee, you know, if you wanted um, any kind of public assistance from the United right. Nations. And so I have um, a good bit of documentation now on my parents, um, which will help me kind of change and tweak their stories. I I have a funny feeling with this. I, I could see this just from talking to you briefly here, uh, because your parents had, I'm sure, so much to offer. And I'm sure you still know people over there now, right? I do. So over I, have friends, I have friends in Germany. I have friends and family in Ukraine. Yes. Okay. I can see this being a series of books. Oh, it's, it certainly could be. In fact, I mean, it's a very good point that you've made. I already have an idea of what I would like the second book to be about. So my, oh. yeah, so my my mother had an older sis, older sister whom she was very close to. And one of the things I talk about in this book, which we didn't even cover by the way, is while both of my parents um, ended up being liberated by the US Army and ended up as refugees and mm -hmm. in the United States, my mother had an older sister, my father had a younger brother younger brother ended up in labor camps as well, but he ended up while trying to escape being captured by the red army forced back to Ukraine with oh. which then became Soviet union. And my mother's older sister had a child couldn't leave when my mother left. And so she was also stuck back behind the iron curtain. And so both my parents had 50 years of not seeing um, or conversing with their siblings for 50 years. The only way that they were able to, you know, share news was through letters, you know, like old snail mail <laughs> letters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to write this whole story about my aunt, my mother's sister, and what it was like on her side of the world during the war after the war um, behind the iron curtain to, to get that point of view, because I doubt, I, I don't think many Americans or Westerners have ever really written a story about what life was like behind the iron curtain. Back there, yeah. Do you have any of those letters by chance? Unfortunately I've been searching, but um, cause I, I asked my, um, my aunt's relatives, you know, right. children, grandchildren, et cetera. 
if they had any of my mother's old letters. And they said, unfortunately, they had lost them all in flooding. Oh. And <clears throat> my family's been trying to find, we have, we have some of the later letters, but they're not very helpful. Like the ones from, right. you know, like the late nineties and early two thousands. Um, but yeah, it would be amazing if we could find some of the really, oh, old letters, God, yeah. you know, from the sixties and seventies, but so far we, we haven't been able to, unfortunately. But at least, at least I'm sure you got plenty of old photos, right? Yes, I have lots of old photos, okay. and um, my my aunt's family. I'm very very close to a cousin of mine um, who would be her grandson, <laughs> so he's like first cousin once removed. But he's very interested in me writing his grandmother's story, and so I know that I'll have um, um, you know I'll have at least secondhand sources. To help me with the second book. Oksana, I think it was a calling <laughs> when the company let you go because yeah. you do, in all honesty, you do have a ser- I mean, a comp- you, you could be like, I'm trying to think of all these different authors. There are so <laughs> many out there that have, have all these series, whether it be Nora Roberts, whether it be, uh, Patterson, uh, yeah, all these people there. And, and just from reading that small chapter on your website, which we haven't even mentioned the website yet, mm-hmm. um, I could tell that people are just going to, uh, this is going to be a definitely an award winning book when it comes out, without a doubt, without a doubt. Thank you. And I know that it's going to, I have a funny feeling the way you, that you're, you finished this first one people are going to want to grab the second one and then the third one and so forth. And when it becomes a, I don't know, do they even do t- with TV movies? Are, do they do mini series? <laughs> I don't know. Well, they do sequels. Know. That's for sure. Okay. <laughs> um, when, when the other thing that I've begun to do is, is, um, is advocacy on Ukraine. So, I mean, you, you read my first chapter. And so, you know, that Mm -hmm. in the beginning I was, you know, giving money and, and trying to, you know, find ways to be involved. I was out, out protesting and, and now I've started to, uh, to, I don't want to call it lobby because I'm not a paid lobbyist or anything, but, but (laughs) I, I, in October I went down to DC and I talked with, um, you know, with, 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 uh, staffers from you mm-hmm. know, my, my Senate and, and, uh, representative offices. And I've started writing too and blogging on a, on a site called medium to kind of, you know, prove my writing chops as well. And to, oh. you know, and to shine a light about what's going on in Ukraine. And so oftentimes I write about, you know, the current political situation we're in, where there's gridlock in Congress and, in, you know, and Congress doesn't want to give Ukraine aid and the money's going to run out at the end of the year. And do we really want to, if you're a Marine, do we really want to pay more later or just pay now? Because, right. you know, Putin goes into Poland or the Baltics because we let him take Ukraine. You know, we're going to have U.S. soldiers down on the ground. Do we really want that? And we're going to be paying a lot right. more than $60 billion a year to, pro- you know, to help Ukraine fight you know, fight our greatest enemy, sorry, you know, our greatest Mm -hmm. enemy for the past, you know, 100 years, Um, Russia, the Russian Federation, Soviet Union. And so I have gotten, you know, really involved in advocacy. And I also want to use, you know, some of the proceeds from from the books to support Ukraine, not just to fight today, but more importantly, in the reconstruction that they're going to need to do. So the other thing that's been helpful with meeting with these Ukrainian advocacy groups is they're tied in to NGOs that are both American and Ukrainian that are helping Mm -hmm. on the ground today, as well as planning how to help Ukraine when there is peace and we can rebuild it and do something, you know, similar to the Marshall Plan like we did in Europe after World War II. Right. Because that will be what Ukraine needs. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So and but to me, this is a it. calling. <laughs> you know, this is yeah. not, oh, this is just going to be a one trick pony, one book. I mean, not only is this a nope. series of books, but this is me, you know, doing a new giving calling, back and, doing giving something, back yeah. and, and making doing a difference thing to 
help Ukraine in the long run, not mm-hmm. just not just today, but in the future. Yeah, I, and I'm, I think more people need to do that too, because and not just from what's happening today, but also telling your parents' story, because I, we talked about it briefly a little bit ago, where people are afraid to have conversations with their family because of politics. Mm-hmm. But you have to, especially with the grandparents and everything, you have to talk to them. If you want to find out about history, talk to them mm-hmm. because, and a lot of times you, you see it now with a lot of the guys that were in Vietnam, mm-hmm. they don't want to talk about it, mm-hmm. but they will talk to certain people. Mm-hmm. You saw it with the, with the guys and the ladies, even from world war two, yeah. you know, they didn't, they want to talk about it, but to the right person, they would. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing it now with everything that went on over in Iraq and Afghanistan and all that. So, sure. uh, you know, I, I applaud you for, you know, all the work you're doing for that. Um, th- that's amazing. Um, actually, do you have any idea when the book's going to be finished? Don't you tell me you just finished it yesterday. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I have to take my trip first. So right. I'm really hoping to have a good what I would call a second draft in end of winter. So, I mean, really focus oh. on the book after I get back from the trip, right? Because there, there will okay. be changes I'll want to make to it. And then it mm-hmm. will really decide, then it will really be determined by when I secure that publisher and how long it takes, you know, the publisher to, to um, then be ready to, to, to publish it. And so, right. um, you know, I do have a, a publisher interested, um, hoping to, you know, be able to get a couple more um, before then. You know, I have been told that it could take a year for these things when, yeah. once you do get a publisher. So we're probably looking at least at another year. Hopefully we can fast track it and I can do whatever I can do to move it, move it more quickly. Uh, because, you know, I, I you know. It, it is a book that really needs to come out. It's a story that needs to yeah. come out and I want it to be, you know, timely for people. All right. And this is your, your first, your first book, just with your name on it. Correct. How in the world did you come about finding a publisher already? Well, let me rephrase that publishers that are interested. Publ- yes. Yes. A publisher yeah. interested. I don't have a, and yeah. it's one publisher. It's, it's not multiple. I, okay. I hope to get multiple, but um, it was through, I, I used the support a bit of a um, book consultant. So um, who has, uh, is a very, you know, very good ghostwriter, you know, New mm-hmm. York Times bestselling um, ghostwriter. And she helped me um, initially um, with, with writing. Now I'm a pretty right. quick study, so... Um, so I, you know, learned, you know, she helped me with some of you know, some tricks to, you know, kind of really brighten the story, right. And get the hooks, yeah. the hooks and everything. And so she helped me with getting into, um, into an, an agent who's a retired agent who then, you know, had suggestions, started talking to some of her agent friends. And so that's how I have, um, you know, an agent or two interested in the book so far. So for you aspiring authors out there, did you hear that? And she's also got two agents interested. Yeah. Remember that. (laughs) But it's it's Um, not easy. And, you know, I've been very, I think it's been a combination of luck. And I do think the timeliness of the story that I'm, that I'm telling. So with the book, what's been the hardest part to write so far? Because I'm sure it, it's it's got to trigger a lot of memories. Honestly, the hardest, and I don't mean hard to put pen to paper. I mean, right. hard to read. Hardest on you. Yeah. And yeah, like hardest on you, hardest on. Um, I would say that I, every time I read that first chapter, I can't mm-hmm. stop crying. Yeah. And if you can, that means when the book comes out, other people aren't, mm-hmm. uh, they're, they're going to be the same way. And that's just going to draw them in. Yeah. And there are a couple of other places. I don't want to 
give things away, but there are a couple other yeah. places where, you know, where, you know, the, the tear, I can't help for the tears not to come when I, when I yeah. read across them, when I was writing them, I wasn't crying. But when I read them, I cry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I guess I separate myself enough when I'm writing, but then when I read over it, it's very emotional. And then there, it would be interesting for your readers as well as I do have some, I, I do have some family secrets too that I share in the book. So oh. I don't want to name them, but that would also be maybe an interesting hook for some of your listeners. So I'm very transparent. So, so she it. was actually I very good at hide and seek. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry. What was that? You mean very bad at hide and seek? I know. I don't. No, that, no, that's the secret. You were good at it. You were just. <laughs> You know, it's funny because um, someone asked me, "Would my, what would my parents, how would they feel about me writing a book about their lives right. now that they're not here?" And Ukrainians in general are very reserved and private mm-hmm. people, and my parents were even more reserved um, and private. And so my whole family is very private. So they would, I think, they would have a hard time with it. Um, however, because there are some secrets that I'm sharing, yeah. they, they purposely kept from us, but documentation doesn't lie. And I think knowing the reason that I'm, I'm hoping at least knowing the reason that I'm mm-hmm. writing this and what I want to contribute to Ukraine and contribute to the world and society, I think they would be okay with it. You know, I, I think so too. No one in my family has challenged me about writing this. They've all been supportive of it. Because they know. though they know I will share, will be sharing some family secrets. And it's because they know that it's that important of a story to come out, that it's not about them, that it's about teaching the world something that maybe we didn't know or realize. And and that's something we need more of. Uh, But it's also something that you're seeing more people do. It is talk about the well, you talk about these things that people are talking about their addictions, people are talking about mental health. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, a lot more people are becoming more comfortable talking about it. And and I think it's also helping people when they hear it, you know, when they listen. So, that, yeah, that makes that makes a big difference for people to know that they're not alone. You know, yes. it's, it's also important to take the shame and the stigma out of experiences, you know, there, Mm -hmm. there are things in lives that all of us cannot control. You know, maybe we were too little, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. we were in the wrong place at the wrong time, but we didn't know it. And so, you know, like my parents, should they have had shame or a stigma because they were slaves of Nazi Germany? I mean, today we would say absolutely not, but right. You know, how many of those 12 million people have written about it or their descendants have written about it? Very few. And that's because the stigma is still there. So we need to we need to open it up and we need to say, no, you were the you. Yes, you were the victim at that time. But it doesn't mean that you're a victim your whole life. Yeah. Yeah. It's something you're doing. And I and I know once the book comes out, you're probably going on podcasts again, promoting the book. Absolutely. But I want to, I want to um, uh, again applaud you because you're doing something that I've never seen another author do. Is you're going talking about the book, going on all these different shows, talking about it, and the book's not even finished yet. <laughs> so I mean, that's that's good marketing right there. In all honesty, so I got to applaud you for that. That is awesome. Um, I, I have to. But I'm also doing this, I'm doing this about the book, but I'm also doing this because, you know, I want Americans, Americans out there to keep supporting Ukraine. I mean, the level of support for Ukraine is diminished in this country and, you know, and Congress is seeing it and, you know, I'm calling my senators and my representatives and When I was in Congress, you know, one of the staffers said, do you know we receive 10 anti-Ukraine calls to every pro-Ukraine call? Wow. And so, you know, 
any listeners on these podcasts, you know, if you care about liberty, you know, if you care mm-hmm. that we don't end up in a direct confrontation with Putin and the Russian Federation in a few years from now, then we all need to be calling our representatives and our senators and telling them, keep giving Ukraine aid. You know, it's supporting right. it's supporting American jobs because the production, military production is happening here. We're not giving them cash. We're giving them arms. And it's keeping, you know, our men and women in, in, the, in, ser- in the service home. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, they're... In. and it's China's watching, too. I mean, you think they're not going to invade Taiwan if they see us back away from Ukraine and let Russia mm-hmm. gobble it up? They're going to say, Oop, green light. Let's go to Taiwan. Exactly. So, I mean, we're going to exactly. be in a head to head conflict with either Russia or with China if we back away from Ukraine now. Yeah. Yeah. We we don't. It's. The, unfortunately, the way everything's looking in the world nowadays, because you got that, you have Israel, you know, mm-hmm. Palestine, you know, it's almost as if everything is leading to another world war. And we don't want that. We definitely don't want that. Um, I, I'm looking at the time, and, and there's yep. a couple other questions I want to ask you real quick. First of all, is your daughter better at hide and seek than you? <laughs> you know, we haven't tried it yet. So <laughs> because she doesn't want to play hide and seek with you, she heard. <laughs> So far, we're only on to chase yet. No, no, that's not true. We do, we we do hide and seek together, but it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a smart and, girl. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. All right. And when it comes to food, we talked about the kibasa earlier. Oh, yeah. God, I gotta get some now. What is your favorite dish to make? So, or restaurant to go so to. So I don't. No, 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 no. I am a cook. I, I do cook. I mean, I'm okay. not a trained cook or anything, but I do love to cook. It's just when you said that, it's so hard because I have a lot of, of dishes. I'm the same way. But I would say the one thing I make that everybody um, kind of drools over is any kind of risotto that I make. Ooh. And the risotto that I love the best because I will make it from fresh lobster stock that I'll, I'll I'll do the lobster stock first and then later I'll make a lobster risotto and everybody loves it. Oh, <laughs> that just sounds so good. Oh, it that is. Sounds good. There's nothing right. better than lobster stock for anything. <laughs> oh, now, and it's been a long time since I've been to Manhattan. So, <laughs> The next time I get up there, what restaurant do I need to go to? And why? And what dish should I get? Okay. So all the rage in Manhattan right now is elevated Korean cuisine. Mm -hmm. And so if, you know, if if you like Asian food, um, there are many amazing Korean restaurants, but I would say Mm -hmm. one that in particular I adore because it's elevated Korean, but it's still traditional. So a lot of the fancy Korean restaurants now in New York just do like Korean fusion, you know, so they don't do the traditional stuff. You know, everything's about making it really interesting and almost European looking. This restaurant called Her Name is Han. It's elevated Korean, but yet it's still traditional. So what dish should I order there? Uh, you'll be happy with just me. too many. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they do uh, some, I really, guess the best thing to do some really good soups. I mean, their soups okay. are out of this world. Their noodle soups really good. So I'll just go in there and do like I do at every other restaurant and just say, surprise me. There you go. Or the, okay. the nice thing is they've got the names and they've got the pictures. So you can just point, you can also, um, just tell them to pick what's good off the menu. Yeah. I just love saying surprise me. It throws people off. <laughs> yeah. I think that's great. <laughs> I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to a restaurant in um, Berlin for New Year's and I picked mm-hmm. it 
because they didn't know yet what the menu for New Year's was going to be. In fact, they oh. said, we will surprise you. And I said, that's the restaurant I want to go to. <laughs> oh, without a doubt, I would do that. Um, before I get to my last question, is there mm-hmm. anything you would like to add? And tell everybody, of course, the website they can go to to read the first chapter and all. So I think other than, you know, if you care about Ukraine, call your senators and representatives. Um, I would say uh, just, you know, stay on top of the news and, you know, watch closely what's happening. And if you are interested in learning more about the writing that I'm doing, you know, there are a couple of really good places to go. The one is the first one is the book's land um, landing page, which is called uh, www.sunflowersrarelybreak.com. You can download the first chapter for free, as Rich did, and take a read. And the second is I'm actively blogging on a on a blogging site called Medium and Medium.com. And I'm writing a lot about Ukraine there, as well as about other current events or even travel I've done in my life. I've traveled to over 90 countries, so I have a lot of travel stories there. I write a combination about Ukraine politics, history, current events, and most of it around Ukraine, as well as uh, general travel. And you can also sample more of my writing there. I've got about 50 articles up there now. All right, so this means you have to come on two more times at least (laughs) because you have to come on when the book comes out or is about to come out, and now you're going to have to come on again to talk about all the places you've been to Mm, mm -hmm. and the, the, the food you've tried there. Oh, yeah. Because for some reason, I talk to people when they travel a lot, but they won't. It's like it sometimes it reminds me of the little kid. Every restaurant you go to, they want chicken tenders and fries. Yes. So, and some people that travel a lot are they do that. It's like you got to try the cuisine of where you go to. Of course. Even the different states here. Of course. You have do. to. Uh, I love I mean, Southern barbecue when I'm down in Alabama. Come on. Oh. <laughs> Well, that's what we're we're going to New Orleans in February, oh, and wow. I've never been yet. And I I I want to try their crabs because here in Maryland, of course, we have the best steamed crabs. Of course you do. But in New Orleans, they don't steam them; they boil them. Mm, yes, that's. True. And I want to try that, and mm-hmm. of course, some crawl that, some good old crawl that. <laughs> okay, so. I love asking this. You've been on several podcasts now. You've been on several interviews. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that a host has never asked you that you wish they would have asked you? And if so, what would be that question and what would be your answer? Um. So a lot of podcasters have asked me, you know, why I'm writing the book or Mm -hmm. what made me write the book, like what the inspiration was. But I don't think anyone except a friend of mine recently asked me, what do I hope to gain by the book and this journey that I'm on? And what is that? I have a funny feeling I know, but tell everybody what that is. Well, I say in the macro aspirational um, way, it's to maybe move the international community to do more, to search for ways to get to peace. And that's extremely aspirational. If I think about in the nearer term, it's to inform more people about Ukraine, Ukrainian history, the Ukrainian people, and for people to understand that Ukrainians suffered under the Nazis as much mm-hmm. as many other groups did, and that there's no way Ukraine would be full of Nazis from those experiences. Right. Well, Oksana, I want to thank you so much. It, it's been a true pleasure to talk to you. And like I said, I, I know this is your path is 
you know, writing a series that I could see, see becoming either a move, movie or movies. Or Netflix or even series. TVs. <laughs> I was going to say, or even a Netflix series. Yeah. You know, you, you never know. You never know. Uh, I'm, they just did it with what? The fault, the, the House of Usher. So they could do it with yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> The Oxana, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rich, for having me. I really enjoyed it. I want to thank my guests for coming on this episode, but I really want to thank you for listening. And I would really appreciate it if you left a review about the show or about this episode. And you can actually do that right from the website. Go to conversationswithrichbennett.com. You can leave a comment about this episode. You can leave a review for the podcast in general. Another thing I would love for you to do, of course, follow us on social media, but send me a voicemail. If there is somebody you want me to get on the show, if you want to come on the show, if there is something you would like for us to discuss, send a voicemail or send an email. If you send a voicemail, if you want, I can actually play it back on the show too. So just saying, Uh, but no, seriously, I, I want to thank you for listening because if it wasn't for you, the podcast wouldn't be as successful as it is. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Celebrating 10 years, and there's a lot of good things going on this year with Rage Against Addiction. So I am sitting here with Wendy, the executive director, the founder of Rage Against Addiction. And we have something big coming up this year. The Memory Walk was it a memory walk 5k it's memory walk recovery run it's rage against addictions memory walk recovery run 2024 Uh, this is our biggest fundraiser of the year Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and our mission is to provide awareness and support to anyone that struggles from drug and or alcohol abuse and this event brings together um, a a large variety of people, um, those who have lost loved ones to the disease of addiction, and also we celebrate those in recovery. So this 5K is um, a run, and we have a lot of runners who are running um, to support recovery. We have runners that run in memory of a, a loved one that is no longer with us, and then we have a really large group of family members that come out, bring photos of their loved ones and just celebrate them and just try to bring some awareness to the disease. Uh, This supports our programs. We have sober living houses in Bel Air, Maryland for women. And we also have some other programs that support uh, new moms in recovery. Uh, We support uh, kids by being a resource broker. And we've done some funding throughout the years to help people get into sober living. So this is this is a big deal for us. This is the the event that brings a lot of awareness to the community. It brings awareness to all that we're doing. And like Rich said, it's our 10th anniversary. So we we really want to let you know that we're here to stay. And the reason that we're doing what we're doing so well is because of all of the support in the community. And so we, we, we welcome you to, to join us. You can also join us virtually through the entire month of April. April uh, 1st through the 30th, we have a virtual event And then the 13th is our actual in-person event at Cedar Lane Regional Park in Bel Air. You can register through our website, which is www.rageagainstaddiction.org. You can find all your info there. Uh, It'll take you to run sign up. You can create a team. You can do some um, independent fundraising with your family in memory of your loved one. And we also welcome sponsors. Sponsors get a place on our website. Your logos will go there. We give a shout out at the event. We're going to have some speakers from our alumni which is really what's near and dear to my heart. And again, it's, you know, it brings us all together and and we hope that you can be there. Uh, Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The run is a 5K, but you can also walk it, which is what, one mile? 
We we have um, a route that goes around Cedar Lane uh, Regional Park. They have a, a path, and when you do the five k, you you do two laps. Our walkers okay. tend to do one, so it's like half. You know, it's probably like okay, it's probably like a, a mile, a mile and a little. Yeah, I can do the walk. You don't have to be here to participate, and we encourage that because we know that no family is immune, and addiction unfortunately isn't going away, and we have a new uh, up and coming generation that was plagued by COVID and we're seeing the youth population really struggle. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure yep. that they continue to have the resources that they need. So again, they go to rageagainstaddiction.org to sign up. Yes. Under events. Or to become a sponsor as well. Oh yes. Please, 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 please sponsor. 